Hi everyone, I am Dr. Whitney Costers, Professor of English, and today I'm going to do a rhetorical analysis on George Orwell's Shooting an Elephant. If you ever plan on enrolling in a composition course, or if you find yourself in one right now, then it is likely that you will be asked to perform a rhetorical analysis at some point or another. And if you're just living life, then you're confronted with thousands of ads, news stories, social media feeds, images, memes, signs, etc., that deliberately use rhetoric to influence you. So you should know how these things are communicating with you, right? Now, before we start the rhetorical analysis, be sure to hit the subscribe button on this channel if you need help with writing, rhetoric, and classic literature, because that is all that we do here. As I said, in this lecture, I'm going to be doing a rhetorical analysis on shooting an elephant. But if you're more interested in the meaning of the elephant and what it symbolizes, then go ahead and check out my video on just that topic linked below. Now, a rhetorical analysis is when you examine a text and explore the way it uses rhetorical devices, the rhetorical situation, and means of persuasion, such as ethos, pathos, and logos, in order to influence its reader of an argument. So what did I just say here? Let's define all of these terms to make sure that we're all on the same page. Let's start with the obvious, rhetoric. It's simply the art of persuasion, how you communicate a message to a specific group of people in order to persuade them of something. And rhetorical situation defines the context or the situation in which the writer communicates. So it considers to whom a writer is speaking, the target audience, in what form of communication the writer chooses to convey a message, genre, and what the writer is trying to achieve, purpose. Once the rhetorical situation is established, the writer will be able to determine the best ways to incorporate means of persuasion, specifically ethos or credibility, pathos or emotion, and logos or logic. And a major way writers appeal to ethos, pathos, and logos is through rhetorical devices, which include, but are not limited to, metaphor, alliteration, hyperbole, irony, satire, sarcasm, paradox, euphemism, personification, rhetorical questions, connotation, pun, and parody. These devices help elicit emotions, put an audience in the right frame of mind that help create trust between reader and writer and provide the details and steps that the reader needs in order to make logical conclusions about the text or even the author. Now, the thing about doing a rhetorical analysis is it's sort of like playing a game of Clue. A text almost never explicitly tells you who the target audience is or how it's employing means of persuasion and using rhetorical devices but it will offer up a variety of clues that can help you identify these things. So this lecture is sort of a guide on helping you to locate this evidence so that you can easily do your own rhetorical analysis on any text. For those of you who haven't read Shooting an Elephant, here is a very quick synopsis. An unnamed narrator is a police officer in Burma, which at the time was part of the British Empire. One day, an elephant escapes and begins destroying property and even killing a man. It is through the narrator's decision to send for a rifle to arm himself as he seeks out the elephant that creates the conflict of this essay. Seeing the white police officer with his accoutrements of power, his badge, race, and gun, the Burmese start following him in mass, expecting to see him shoot the elephant. But the narrator doesn't want to shoot it, and he knows he shouldn't but it's the pressure to perform the acts of dominance and power upon which empire is built that leads the narrator to act against his better judgment and shoot the elephant in a violent, drawn out and heart-wrenching scene. And at the end, he admits that he did it only to avoid looking a fool. When you do a rhetorical analysis, start with the rhetorical situation first, genre, target audience, and purpose. Let's start with the easy part first, genre. This is less a story and more of an essay, since it's not a creative piece intended to entertain. It's really an essay since it gives the narrator the space and scope to adequately share his thoughts on a topic as a means to persuade his audience. In order to discover purpose, it's helpful to know the context of the text. Do any basic research and you'll easily find that Orwell himself was a police officer in Burma and left his post feeling disgruntled with the workings of empire. He wrote Shooting an Elephant in 1936, a time when the British Empire was dying and anti-imperialist sentiments were pretty strong. 
So the text's purpose is to convince the target audience of the evils of imperialism, but not in the way that you might think. I can explain what I mean by that as we look at the text's argument. In the text, the narrator uses the rhetorical device irony to argue that imperialism is evil, not just because of the injustices it creates for the oppressed, but because it also robs the oppressor of his own freedom. But exactly whom is he addressing? Well, there are a few clues that make it clear who the target audience is. First, we know the target audience can't be the Burmese. For one thing, I think the oppressed people are very well aware of the evils of imperialism. No need to convince them. And secondly, do you think that they would be an appropriate audience to express the argument that imperialism is evil because it hurts the very people who are hurting them? They're not going to read this. At one point, the narrator says that seeing the Burmese, these wretched prisoners lying in stinking cages who have scarred buttocks from floggings, oppressed him with a sense of intolerable guilt. Now, the narrator isn't being tone deaf or dramatic here. I mean, he really is in a crisis, a conflict. But this would be absolutely lost on the Burmese. They're certainly not going to empathize with him. Furthermore, as the narrator comes across the man whom the elephant kills, he says, never tell me, by the way, that the dead look peaceful. Most of the corpses I have seen look devilish. Now, who would be under the impression that all these Burmese who are dying look peaceful? Sounds like an observation intended to overlook the horrors of imperialism. And who would be doing that? The British. Also, the narrator makes plain that this is not just his experience. He reminds the reader that I had to think over my problems in the utter silence that is imposed on every Englishman in the East. And he says feelings like these are the normal byproducts of imperialism. Ask any Anglo-Indian official. Clearly, his target audience is the English, his fellow officers, or any Englishman who continues to believe in imperialism as an enlightening measure and enforce colonial power out of what they saw as moral obligation and Christian duty. So, we just determined the rhetorical situation of the text. And we did this first because you can't identify ethos, pathos, and logos until you know the purpose, target audience, and genre. So now the question is, how does the narrator use rhetorical devices and means of persuasion to effectively fulfill his purpose and convince other British imperialists that imperialism is just as destructive to them as it is to the Burmese? Now, I'm going to be talking about ethos first, but just understand that ethos, pathos, and logos are not necessarily always mutually exclusive elements of a text. So while I may find one appeal to ethos, it doesn't mean that it can't also be an appeal to logos and or pathos. So we will be talking about all three means of persuasion at once. In terms of ethos, the narrator is a very credible source to make this claim. After all, he is a white man, a police officer, a member of the British Empire living in Burma who is required to enforce imperialist policies and sees firsthand the dirty work of empire at close quarters. And this incident with the elephant that has enlightened him to the real nature of imperialism is not just a story that he heard through the grapevine, it's his own. He's also quite identifiable. He's no hero. He's an ordinary man who is filled with complex and ambivalent feelings toward a challenging and morally compromising situation. He understands why the Burmese hate him, but he's also not above feeling frustration and bitterness over the way that they treat him. Now, I've been speaking about the narrator, but the fact that Orwell himself was also an imperial police officer in Burma lends the text ethos and logos as well. Perhaps the most compelling means of persuasion that the narrator employs in shooting an elephant is pathos. Even though you are not the target audience, think about the variety of emotions that you felt while reading this essay. When I teach this in my classes, I start the lecture out by asking my students whom they sympathize with the most, the narrator, the Burmese, or the elephant. Overwhelmingly, my students say they sympathize with the elephant. Then they say they feel a little more sympathy for the narrator and then very little for the Burmese. And this is how the narrator wants us to feel. Remember, his target audience is fellow British imperialists. 
An attempt to make them feel pity for the Burmese is not the most effective means to argue the evils of imperialism. They need to identify with the narrator and the elephant, which actually metaphorically stands for the British Empire. So how does the narrator manage to direct our sympathies in this way? In other words, how does he manage to make us feel so little for the very people who are burdensomely oppressed by the British? Well, we can look at the first line for a couple of clues. He says, in Lower Burma, I was hated by large numbers of people. The only time I have ever been important enough for this to happen to me. This sentence tells us that he's not hated because by nature he's a jerk. This is why he tells us that this was the first time he was even worth stirring up such extreme feelings in others. Despite working for the empire, the narrator presents himself truthfully as a victim of a real conflict that arises from the enforcement of colonialism. He is severely unhappy and acknowledges that he's stuck between my hatred of the empire I served and my rage against the evil spirited little beast who tried to make my job impossible. By rendering himself open and vulnerable to us, we can more easily identify with him. This is ethos. We are meant to feel his disillusionment, his predicament, and how very real his feelings of oppression are. We are not, however, asked to elicit this same pathos toward the Burmese who, remember, are also very real victims of colonialism. So how does Orwell manage to direct our sympathies away from the Burmese? We need to look at the way in which they're described. The narrator describes them or refers to them as little beasts, sneering yellow faces, watchful yellow faces, um, various Burmese, the crowd, several thousands, the people, the Burmese population, the whole population, um, gray cowed faces, long-term convicts, wretched prisoners, and a large number of people. Furthermore, they're described as having a devilish roar of glee and hideous laughter. They're people who will spit juice on a European woman and insult the narrator and jeer at Europeans. So what do practically all of these descriptions have in common? They're impersonal and collective in nature. Essentially, the Burmese are presented as a mob, a sea of people that are meant to seem like all the same wretched, hateful person. It's a mob that pressures the narrator, makes him feel uncomfortable. And if he feels uncomfortable, he makes sure that he elicits in the readers the same feelings of discomfort. It's more difficult to sympathize with a large, faceless group, especially when they're identified primarily by their wretchedness and hatred. Now, there is one time when the narrator singles out a Burmese, the man who is crushed by the elephant, but even this description desensitizes us. You should compare the way that he describes the death of the coolie to the way he describes the death of the elephant. The coolie is described primarily in grotesque ways, and his death is made meaningful to the reader only because it's the narrator's motivation to send for a rifle. There is little attachment to him, and he's abandoned almost as quickly as he's introduced. Now, the narrator's greatest and most effective means of persuasion is the way he elicits pathos through the rather graphic, slow, and violent murder of the elephant, which in and of itself is a rhetorical device since the elephant is an emotionally charged metaphor for the British Empire. The narrator manages to make the elephant's death a very unsettling experience for us, explaining that he felt pressured, unnerved, uneasy, and certain that he ought not to shoot him. In fact, he tells us he doesn't want to shoot him. He employs the rhetorical device simile when he compares the death of an elephant to the destruction of a costly piece of machinery, which is intended to make the reader feel even more uneasy that he eventually kills it because it forces us to recognize how great the consequences of this are. But he does ultimately shoot it despite these misgivings, so he employs logos throughout the essay through a solid structure that lays out the chain of events step by step that led to his decision to shoot it. He may carry all the markers of power and control, but in reality, as he says, I grasp the hollowness, the futility of the white man's dominion in the East. I was only an absurd puppet pushed to and fro by the will of those yellow faces. I perceived that when the white man turns tyrant, it is his own freedom that he destroys. Thus, the narrator employs the rhetorical device irony by explaining that in order to keep his external power, he must be a crowd's puppet. 
And this irony is further meant to appeal to Logos in that it makes sense that a low-level police officer of Imperial Burma would feel this tension. The irony also appeals to pathos in that we are meant to feel devastation and shock at how much suffering has been endured among the natives, the narrator, and the elephant, all that is totally in vain. I do remember reading this essay for the very first time many years ago, and I still vividly remember how sick to my stomach I was over the way that the elephant suffered and was simply abandoned by the narrator who selfishly couldn't bear to watch it slowly die anymore. The narrator is detailed and graphic in his description of the elephant's demise and thus makes great emotional demands on his readers. The pathos in favor of the elephant is so strong that we are expected to give all our sympathy, outrage, and indignation to the elephant over anyone else. Because it is a metaphor for empire, the elephant must die slowly and painfully. After all, you can't just snap your fingers and immediately remove the effects of empire and imperialism, right? And you should ask yourself why, of all animals out there, Orwell chose an elephant. Think about the associations that you have with elephants. They're enormous, grand, strong, beautiful, powerful. The reader is asked to keep these descriptions at the forefront of his or her mind when witnessing this violence, terror, and suffering. I often think of Rome's end when I read it. It's long, painful, and bloody. We watch the narrator pour shot after shot into the elephant's body, and we feel his agony. We listen to his strained breathing, and we see the thick blood well out of him like red velvet, another simile. And then, after the elephant suffers for another 30 minutes and finally dies, he's stripped to the bones by the rapacious Burmese. It's hard not to feel sorry for this poor animal. Remember the point of view that the narrator maintains throughout the essay, though. His argument is not focused on the injustices suffered by the Burmese. So we're not asked to read the Burmese rapacity as a desperate need for the very resources that have been taken from them by the British. Seeing it in this way would defeat Orwell's purpose. What better way to force his colleagues to recognize that they too are in the same position as the narrator than continuing to present the Burmese as a rapacious mob and the police officer as a victim of tension and moral conflict? In the end, the reader is meant to feel nothing positive about imperialism. The Burmese make us feel unsettled. The narrator expresses disdain for his job, empire, and the Burmese population, and the elephant is subjected to real violence and suffering. And all of this is done, as I said earlier, out of pure vanity. So in the end, Orwell is persuading the reader to adopt his anti-imperialist sentiments. I certainly didn't address every rhetorical device or every example of ethos, pathos, and logos that appear in this text, but nevertheless, I hope it gave you a good idea or at least a good start on how to go about doing a rhetorical analysis. For more examples of how to do a rhetorical analysis, please check out my videos on Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal and a video in which I do a rhetorical analysis on a print ad. Both of those are also linked below. Take care and I hope to see you guys in the next lecture.